came over here and started to work immediately with Lockheed. His name was Subakov, I believe was his name, Anatoly Subakov, Alexei Subakov. This fellow was also a pioneer and such. His name was Paul Benowitz. Uh, he was going to go public with the UFO and the alien agenda thing. He was, uh, he was a CIA pilot. He was also with the U.S. Air Force. Of course, they couldn't let that happen. And so they, um, they uh, stepped him in the trunk of a car one night, took him off to a mental institution, and uh, made him into a, a mental vegetable. He can't even write his own name today. If it wasn't for a brother who spent a million dollars and a sister looking, looking for him, uh, he'd probably still been rotting away in some institution somewhere. Okay. What we've got here, like I mentioned, is, is alien, basic alien technology that was adapted uh, for us. Uh, uh, Paul Benowitz, once again, he developed and uh, developed the shape of this aircraft as well as uh, the uh, how the bombs were to be dropped. He was also into other projects through Los Alamos. Uh, this, this is in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I'll tell you a few statistics about this during the Gulf War. Would you like to borrow this? No, sure. Thank you. Uh, during the Gulf War, this particular aircraft uh, had four large bombs underneath, they were called smart bombs, uh, cruise missiles, and also rockets, and uh, machine gun fire, Wolfen cannon style, but even more advanced than that, I don't really know quite about that. Um, there was one pilot that sat in here, he literally had to be crammed in, actually right up in here, they had to literally wedge him in there, and uh, took a certain weight and size of individual in this aircraft. And uh, all the Computronics was made by Mitsubishi uh, Computronics and Heavy Electric Industries. Uh, the uh, jets were both uh, turbine as well as nuclear powered for extremely high flight. Uh, by the way, the smart bombs that were used in the Gulf War, uh, 58 aircraft ran 3,706 sorties or missions. 100% of the bombs hit the target. 100% of the rockets hit the target. Um, shot up, completely destroyed the Iraqi air, uh, Iraqi air defense systems. Um, it was a 100% system. Only one aircraft suffered one small uh, um, hit, or actually where a missile just barely missed it, and it just chipped out part of that, but the aircraft was able to make it home. It was a minor repair aircraft back in service. But anyway, now there, there's some 179 of these built. They're building about uh, one every other month. They're about, they're a $208 million aircraft, uh, while this one here is about a $188 million aircraft and it's fraught with problems. Although recently, the F-117A uh, Black Jet, as they're known as, um, originally housed uh, at Nellis Air Force Base, Tonopah Test Range, S-4, Groom Lake, you name it. Uh, these aircraft employed a three-dimensional radar. Everybody else's radar was two-dimensional. Uh, the, uh, the, the black jets employed a three-dimensional radar, which was far superior uh, and, and its Computronics too also had a Cray system to analyze uh, analyze bombing targets, and, and uh, it was also the first aircraft where the pilot wore a helmet. It was called uh, in a, uh, psychoenergetic range finding. It's a copy from the Russian technology, uh, Soviet Russian technology, where uh, a pilot can think in his own language and arm his weapons. And, and pick his target from his computer. It's 
still employed uh, in a second and third generation. It's extremely accurate. It cannot be faked. In other words, if another pilot uh, decides to uh, commit sabotage and jump in the cockpit, the plane won't, won't, the plane won't even begin to run, let alone, let alone uh, any of the missiles firing or anything else. So it's kind of a unique system. It's kind of like the signature gun. And of course, we've heard about those in, in different movies and whatnot. Now we have the Aurora, which is a trans-atmospheric vehicle. And the Aurora, there's four of them currently being tested. I know it's been refuted, too, by a couple of uh, local gum shows before my lecture. He says, well, you, the Aurora doesn't exist. Bill, you know that. I said, well, really? And he says, well, I guess you don't think this exists either. And that's a picture of that. He says, man, he says, no, that doesn't exist either. And I said, really? Hmm, interesting. I suggest you have a seat and learn something. But they have one surpassing the Aurora now, too? Yes, there are two other prototypes that are small space shuttles uh, capable of speeds in excess of 40,000 miles an hour. And plus, we also employ 29 prototypes of flying saucer and uh, are successful in piloting those at up to 90,000 miles an hour in the atmosphere without burning up. That's doing something because when you push, you go beyond Mach 3, actually beyond Mach 2.7, you, you ionize the air around it and uh, you, cause the, uh, you cause the elements of the air to actually catch fire and, and you need a force field around that system to exceed Mach 3 or Mach 4 without burning up because you'll be, you'll be as hot as a glowing meteorite coming out at about 30 or 40,000 degrees. Anyway, the Aurora, there's four of them flying. They fly day and night. Uh, they have 12 people in it as a crew. They can have a skeleton crew of as few as, uh, as, few as six. Uh, they can uh, basically leave uh, Tony Bautest range at 7 o'clock in the morning, do a complete loop around Russia and China and take all the pictures. They're predominantly a spy plane. They can take pictures, come back for lunch. That's how rapid it is. They, uh, they attain uh, from basically zero. They're not one <coughs> again. This aircraft, this aircraft, and this aircraft are anti-lifting bodies. They are not conventional winged aircraft. A flying saucer theoretically is a, is a uh, circular wing. Um, this one, these are not, uh, these are anti-lifting bodies. In other words, it takes an incredible amount of speed before they're able to take off. Um, this is, a, once again, this is all part of the, the one world government type system. Uh, I try to stay away from the political ambush, so kind of like the one world government system. Uh, uh, take over the planet and hopefully we don't have to tell the people of the planet what the alien agenda is. The alien agenda is uh, what probably never meant, the aliens never meant that we were going to alter the bargain, but the aliens were the ones back in 1954 who cut a treaty with us saying that, well, we'll give you a list of the people that we uh, implant and, uh, and the cattle we mutilate um, and we'll give you the reason why and everything. Of course, that never happened. And they kept altering the bargain until finally, uh, uh, in 1979, in Dulce, New Mexico, I was involved in that operation. Uh, we had gone down there to build a, a, an auxiliary base in the southern end of Dulce, New Mexico, already existing base on Rancho Leyte Mesa. And uh, lo and behold, uh, when we drilled down, uh, we found aliens were already in there and have been in there for some time. Um, I can tell you when you're standing, say, as I am here, to where this gentleman is over here, and that's an alien gray who's pretty much seven feet tall and the meanest looking bastard you ever saw and uh, uh, not looking like a human being, uh, you kind of get petrified. And as an engineer, of course, I uh, didn't carry a regular, regular big 40, clunky 45 or anything built because it would get in the way. I carried tools and other kinds of things on my belt, and I always carried a small pistol, Walter BPK, with a nine-shot clip, 380, and uh, I emptied one clip.